Hello everyone, welcome to Tiny ML Summit 2021. My name is Huishu Liu. I'm a research scientist at the Facebook Reality Lab Silicon Research. I will be the moderator of the first session of the tutorial. The title of the first presentation is Training a Magic Wand by Pete Warden. Pete Warden is a technical lead of the TensorFlow Lite micro open source uh, project at Google and I was previously the CTO of Jetpack, a machine learning startup acquired by 20. He's an author of the Tiny ML book from O'Reilly and has also taught embedded machine learning at Stanford and Harvard. And also he has upcoming uh, edX online course. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any questions during the tutorial, please use the Q&A panel uh, on Invente. So let's welcome Pete. Thanks so much, you two. Um, and hi, everybody. It's really exciting to be here. Um, this is going to be a 45 minute workshop where I'm going to take you through how to put together a magic wand uh, using an Arduino Nano 33 BLE sense board. Um, this is going to be uh, quite quick uh, for some of you. So one of the things that I've done is I've actually put these slides up at the URL that you'll see at the bottom left corner. So that's uh, cut.ly slash RXH capital F capital L J M. So don't worry if I'm, uh, you know, moving too fast or if you want to jump ahead, uh, just jump onto that link and you'll be able to see all of these slides um, and uh, do this at your own pace. And I also believe um, that you'll be able to access uh, video of this talk um, as a registered attendee after the uh, event is finished. So um, if you miss something, you'll have another chance to hear it through that as well. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, what I'm going to be showing you today is how to use um, machine learning to recognize gestures uh, with a uh, magic wand uh, that you can see here. Um, I'm going to show you how to build a magic wand using an Arduino. I'm actually going to take you through uh, recording your own training data and actually training and deploying your own model. So we're going to start off with a pre-trained ML model um, to begin with. But in this next 45 minutes, I'm also going to show you how you can actually train and deploy your own custom model. Um, and if you want um, more tutorials like this and uh, more in-depth content like this, I highly recommend the edX TinyML course, um, which you can take for free um, at, uh, this link, um, and course three is focused on deploying, um, ML on, uh, tiny devices like this, um, and actually includes, um, a lot of this material has been tested, uh, there. Um, so if you want another look at this, you can also, uh, go there and sign up. Um, and thanks to the whole team. Uh, that helped uh, put that um, course together. Uh, this uh, tutorial is really a, a big team effort, uh, so I just want to acknowledge them. So, hopefully, uh, you have an Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense board. Um, there's the Tiny ML Starter Kit that you can buy from Arduino which is nice because it also includes uh, cables and a camera. Um, but uh, what you fundamentally need is this Arduino Nano 33 BLE sense board, uh, and you need uh, to be able to plug it in. Uh, you need most laptop or desktop computers are able to run the Arduino IDE. Um, so uh, as long as you have uh, something like that, you should be able to um, plug in your Arduino. And you'll need some kind of stick. <laughs> I've, I've actually got a sort of a plastic um, uh, wand that I picked up off, uh, you know, of Amazon, 
Uh, but really, any foot long, uh, you know, piece of wood or anything um, that you can hold in your hand and wave around uh, will actually do for this. So, one shortcut you can take is if you really don't want to um, mess around with sticky tape, you can actually hold the Arduino just um, in your hand and do gestures that way. Um, you won't find that it works that well with the pre-trained digit model that we're going to use first, uh, because that's being trained expecting that the Arduino is on the end of a stick. Um, but uh, you'll still be able to train your own custom uh, gestures and recognize those. And the wand itself, uh, it really can be as simple as a stick. It doesn't need to do anything other than just keep the board in place as you hold it and uh, wave it around. Um, like I said, there's loads of cheap wands that you can buy from online retailers and use them, but just a piece of wood, a ruler, or even a thick piece of cardboard uh, will work just as well. So I've got a close up here of um, this wand that I put together. Um, the main thing you need to do is just make sure that the cable um, is actually uh, running down the uh, shaft of the wand um, and the USB cable is plugged in so that the bottom of the um, Arduino is actually um, connected uh, and the bottom is where the USB connection actually is. Um, and you can see an image uh, down below where I've just uh, taped it in place. Um, using some sticky tape or some other easy to remove method is uh, ideal. Um, and it's nice if you can just use a little bit to hold the um, cable in place when you're waving it around. So hopefully that won't be too, um, uh, too tricky. Let me just switch to see if I can uh, present this. Well, I'm going to uh, use um, window presentation for this because I actually need to uh, show you what's happening um, in the Arduino ID anyway. So if I the next stage is you need to actually make sure that you've got the Arduino IDE. Uh, and that is a matter of, I'm going to walk you through uh, just downloading this. Um, you go to this arduino.cc.n software link. And then on the side here, you actually pick your operating system. So you can see it's got versions for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, if you have a Chromebook, there are actually some options for that, but that gets a little bit more complicated. So I'm not going to uh, dive into that in this tutorial. But in my case, I'm on Mac OS. So I'll click on the download. Um, Feel free to uh, contribute, uh, but in my case, I'm just going to uh, download the IDE. And I've got a nice fast connection, so it doesn't take too long. Uh, and then normally I would actually uh, open this up and uh, drag this in. Uh, but in my case, um, I've already got the Arduino IDE installed, so uh, I'll uh, I'll let you do that step on your own. And then we're going to actually run the Arduino IDE. And the very first thing we want to do is make sure we've got the uh, board installed. So here. Uh, I describe how you search for embed. That's the magic um, string that I found most useful to install the Arduino embed enabled board packages. So if you go to now tools, board, boards manager, 
and then you do a search for embed, you should see just one, uh, one board come up. And I've already got this installed, um, but uh, you typically just hit uh, install here um, and you'd actually uh, go through a series of steps where things are downloaded um, and then you should actually be able to use your Arduino uh, Nano board. So next, we're actually going to install the TensorFlow Lite micro library itself. And this is a library that includes the machine learning um, parts that we're going to actually be using. Uh, this is the code that I work on. Um, and the way we're going to do that is actually go to sketch, include library, manage libraries. So, One question, Pete. Um, yes. Sorry for the interruption. So we have yeah, a no, question. Uh, that it, uh, can we use uh, the Adreno 2.0 IDE? So I haven't tried it myself. Um, I really should, uh, but I hope you can. Uh, most of these steps should uh, be fairly similar from what I know. And I've actually also successfully used the online uh, Arduino Create IDE uh, as part of this. Um, I don't have the steps for that since the most common uh, version that people are still using is the uh, V1 Arduino IDE on the desktop. Um, but uh, knock on wood, uh, should work on uh, all of the current versions of the Arduino ID. Thank you, Pete. So, thanks, you too. Um, so I'm going to go to include library, manage libraries, and this time the uh, magic string that I'm going to search for is Harvard uh, because we were putting together the uh, the edX course uh, together with a team at Harvard. Um, and so we have the library uh, named Harvard uh, underscore tiny MLX. Um, and this is uh, what you'll uh, want to install. Again, I've actually got this uh, already installed, so um, I won't go ahead and do this, but you'll just click install. Uh, wait a few seconds, and then you should have it um, available. And one way that you can check to make sure you've got it available is if you go in the Arduino ID to File, Examples, and then if you scroll down to um, the Arduino uh, TensorFlow Lite, you should see a series of um, examples that you can actually open up there. And we're going to be using the uh, magic wand example a little bit later, um, but that will come once we've got everything set up. So one question is why we're using the Arduino library, um, since uh, there's an official um, TensorFlow library that's available in the Arduino Library Manager uh, that you can find by searching for TensorFlow. Um, we're trying to just make sure that this um, is absolutely guaranteed to work, this tutorial, even if you uh, come to it in six months or eight months or a year, uh, when small details like API names and other things may have changed in the latest uh, TensorFlow library that you get from Arduino. Um, so in the Harvard TinyMLX uh, version, we've actually taken a snapshot of the library um, so we can be as sure as possible that everything's just going to uh, work completely out of the box if you're following these instructions. Uh, there shouldn't be any major, we're not expecting any major changes with the, ten, with the uh, if you're using the latest TensorFlow library, uh, what you're learning should still be applicable there, but we just wanted to make sure um, as much as possible that there were no hitches <clears throat> if this is your first experience. So the first thing we want to do uh, is actually make sure that your board connection 
is working okay. Uh, because getting the Arduino connected and successfully able to upload um, example uh, sketches uh, is often the biggest hurdle when I'm running through this with uh, students in the classroom. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is how to actually um, take the Blink example, which you'll find in File Examples 0.1.basics Blink. Uh, and then if I choose um, Upload, um, and one of the things to make sure is first that you've chosen um, the, uh, you've got the board chosen as the Arduino um, Nano 33 BLE, which is listed here. Make sure that there's a check mark there. And also make sure that you've actually got a serial port chosen that has the um, Arduino Nano 33 BLE um, in brackets after it. Um, so uh, those should both be set up um, if you want to uh, be able to successfully um, upload a program. And if those are set up, uh, then I'm going to try uploading this Blink program, which uh, should make an LED on this um, uh, on this board just blink on and off. So I'm going to try uh, building and uploading it now. And it takes a minute or two. Uh, and you may see some text in the uh, console there. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's uh, it's no problem. Um, and you should hopefully see done at the end once it's finished. And uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing temporarily so you can actually hopefully see this LED uh, blinking on and off about once a second. So that tells me that the um, board is able to be flashed with a simple program. Um, so uh, I've actually been able to successfully uh, connect my board. Uh, and because there are so many different things that can go wrong, uh, we've actually got this FAQ uh, that we've put together for the edX course about common errors that you might run into when you're trying to upload your board, uh, upload to your board. Um, so you can find um, lots of different uh, things that you can try across Linux, Windows, and uh, Mac OS to try and troubleshoot if you're having uh, problems with this stage. Um, hi, Pete. We have another question, a quick question while we're on this uh, um, like Q&A page. Um, so, like, would this also work on ESP32 MCU, which is also compatible with the Adreno IDE? So, um, this does not work out of the box on the Arduino, on the ESP32. Uh, mostly because it's actually using uh, the Arduino um, board-specific uh, APIs to access the IMU and the accelerometer. Um, we're expecting and we're hoping to um, have this ported to other common boards as well. Um, it shouldn't, there's, there's nothing that's um, pre uh, preventing that. Um, except that, that we just need some work to adapt it to work with different uh, IMUs and accelerometer APIs. Thank you, Pete. So um, now we're going to try and do the same thing, except uh, we're going to um, upload the magic wand example. So we're going to go to, we're going to close that sketch and we're going to go to file examples. Uh, in this case, I think it's 
me just make sure this is the I hold on a second I have to make sure I'm actually looking at the uh, correct examples here because uh, I do tend to install lots of different uh, uh, I'm just going to go to manage libraries and make sure I have the Harvard library correctly installed. Uh, and go to the Arduino IDE. This is a fun thing about live demos. Is there's always uh, uh, you get to see me actually uh, debugging in real time. So if I go to examples, and then I go to here, we have the Harvard Tiny MLX, and you go to Magic Wand, you should see uh, this uh, this example sketch appear. And you just need to make sure that you've got the right um, uh, board and um, uh, port selected here. Uh, and then you can see you've got this uh, the standard setup and loop. Uh, we're going to be using WebBLE, so you'll see some BLE code in here. Uh, and we're going to try uploading this now. So fingers crossed. So take a minute or two. Uh, but we should be able to uh, upload this and um, then we'll see the magic wand working. And while I'm doing this, uh, if you do want to skip ahead, um, you'll see uh, some troubleshooting tips here about how to make sure you've got the right uh, port selected. Um, and you might have missed it, but when I uh, actually went to deploy, I went to hit this uh, button uh, up in the uh, top left corner, uh, the arrow pointing to the right. Uh, so that is the upload button. And the first thing we're actually going to do is use the uh, serial monitor um, to actually uh, see what the um, magic wand is outputting when we do uh, different gestures. So I'm going to be uh, bringing up the serial monitor so that we can actually view uh, what's happening. You can see uh, if you look down in this corner, uh, it's um, working away. Um, so it's still uh, compiling. Um, and hopefully it will uh, uh, be done in another minute or two. Uh, so this sometimes happens when you have the uh, serial port open. So I'm just going to uh, stop that. See if we can just do another upload. And this time it should be uh, hopefully a little bit faster since it's already done uh, a bunch of the work and has cached it. And there we go, we're actually seeing this uploading the magic wand uh, sketch. It's uh, only taking a few seconds and fingers crossed it should say done. And it's actually reset. And now I'm going to go to the serial monitor. And with any luck, when I try 
waving the wand, you see it. I moved the wand and it made, uh, it wasn't sure what gesture I found. Um, it gave a very low score, minus 79, thought it might have been a three. But let's try doing a seven and see if I can actually get a seven. Oh, no, it thought I found, it thought I did a two. So let's try this again. There we go. We actually got it to recognize a uh, seven. So if you made it this far, you have actually managed to use the magic wand to recognize um, your own gestures. Uh, let me just try and see if I can get it to recognize a six. And there, it actually found a six. So it wasn't just a, a fluke. Um, so this is using about a thousand gestures that I've actually uh, trained myself um, as a training set. Um, so you can try making uh, different shapes with the wand um, and see if it's actually able to uh, recognize what you're doing. I'm gonna I'm gonna push my luck and try uh, one more. I'm gonna try a zero. And there you can see, uh, if you can see in the ASCII art, I sort of messed up the zero at the top a bit. So it thought it was uh, kind of a six, but it wasn't sure because uh, it gave a, uh, a fairly low score. Um, so this is the easiest way to actually just double check um, initially what the uh, magic wand uh, thinks it's finding. Um, and the next thing you can do uh, is actually connect this up to the web. Um, so if you go to this tinymlx.org slash magic wand, uh, this is a page uh, that uses the Bluetooth capabilities of that uh, magic wand uh, of the BLE sense that we've got uh, strapped onto there uh, to actually send data back and forth. Um, so I'm gonna hit the Bluetooth button to connect, uh, you'll see a device here uh, that's uh, able to pair. And if I click pair, uh, then you'll see that it's actually uh, waiting for me to make a gesture. So if I do a gesture like this, uh, you'll see that it actually shows up um, in the uh, right hand side. Um, and if uh, you continue making gestures, um, you should see um, them sort of building up and accumulating here. And what you can do uh, is if you have gestures that you're not happy with, you can hit the trash can icon and get rid of them. Uh, if you do like some of these gestures, you can actually add your own labels. So. I'm going to try and create a whole bunch of different, me doing a bunch of different Z's. Um, and you can see here, uh, you can actually review how they look. And if, for example, I do a Z that I'm not happy with, like there, uh, you can actually uh, put it in the trash can. But otherwise, you can actually add your own uh, labels. So here, I'm going to put, you know, Z. Uh, and then, you know, I might want to do, you know, that I just moved the wand, it didn't go very far, so I'm just going to trash that one. Um, you might want to do other, uh, you know, you might want to do a, a Z and then do some O's. And so then you would add O labels. Um, and pick the shapes that you're interested in. Um, and then once you've collected, I recommend collecting about, uh, you know, 10 or 20 of each gesture and maybe having two or three gestures. You can hit download data. And this will actually download um, a JSON file, which contains all of the information about the strokes that you've just done. So we've gone through uh, this. You may um, find some help in the slides if you're hitting any sort of uh, connection issues. Um, 
And then, uh, as I mentioned here, you record your own gestures, get rid of any which are kind of accidental or small gestures that you don't want to um, capture. Um, use how the gesture looks in the preview to decide if you actually want to uh, keep that gesture or not. Um, and then go through, label your gestures, and then download this uh, JSON file. Um, and one thing to be careful of is that if you refresh this page, all of this data that you've downloaded or that you've captured will be uh, lost unless you hit the download data file. Um, so make sure if you've put a lot of work into capturing your gestures, make sure you don't navigate away from that page. Next, I'm going to show you how to go to a um, Colab, a Python uh, script, uh, where you can actually um, train your own data, train using your own data. Um, and I'm going to run through this um, because I didn't want to uh, spend the time going through and capturing all of the gestures uh, for, um, you know, a custom I'm going to train using the data set that I'd already gathered. Uh, but other than that, everything I'm doing here should be uh, the same that you're doing on a uh, custom uh, on your own gestures. So if you're not familiar with uh, Colab and Python notebooks, um, you press, uh, I find you can either press the play button uh, on the left, or I find like clicking on a cell and pressing shift return um, will actually um, run everything you need to do. Um, the training for this only takes um, a minute or two. So I'm actually going to run through this uh, during the workshop uh, and show you how to get um, the uh, model that uh, you trained out of the other end. Well, we're on this page, uh, we do have like uh, two questions regarding sure. to, uh, the model. So the first is that is um, like uh, it looks like it's a feed forward neural net. Um, yes. So how many layers and how many units each layer has? This is the uh, first question. That's a that's a great question, and you actually can see a visualization while uh, that setup code is running. Uh, let me see if I can find the, um, here's the definition of the model. We're using Keras here, um, and it has three convolution layers um, using ReLU out, uh, activations, uh, followed by global average pooling. Um, and uh, the layers, um, I think there's uh, 16 filters, uh, three by three with slide of two. And then the second one is 32 filters, again, a size of three with a slide of two. And then the last one is um, 64 uh, channels, 64 filters with a size of three. Um, so it's if you're used to doing any kind of um, uh, you know, even something like MNIST, you might recognize this as a very straightforward um, feed forward uh, neural network. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we do have a second question on optimization of the model size for microcontroller. So for example, Angel uh, Nano has some hundreds of flash RAMs to store. So um, there may be some limitations to enlarge the model like multi-label classification. So could you comment on this, please? Yes, um, so for this, um, we use, uh, if I go down here, uh, we actually uh, use quantization to shrink the model. Uh, the model as it is will recognize 10 digits uh, in about 30 kilobytes. Um, so it's it fits quite nicely within uh, kind of an embedded um, device. Um, but uh, if you want to recognize more gestures, the size shouldn't have to increase that much. You might have to increase the model size, uh, like 
the number of um, convolutional filters or networks if you have, if you want more accuracy, for example. Um, but uh, it, this uh, works reasonably well. Um, so hopefully size won't be a, an immediate issue for this application. Thank you, Pete. Okay, so let's see if the initial setup is finished. Uh, it looks like that's done. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, go through um, here. Uh, in this case, um, I'm actually going to be uh, using my own data set rather than you would run the cell above and not uncomment this, but I'm just going to uh, grab uh, this public data set. Uh, one thing you have to be careful of is setting the number of gestures to how many gestures you've actually recorded. Uh, we're going to grab the data set. Uh, we're just going to have um, some helper functions here. If I hit this, you can see we're like displaying one of the gestures uh, in our data set. Um, and then uh, these cells are just doing some uh, utility functions. So we just have to make sure that they've been uh, included. Uh, we convert all of the uh, strokes from our data set into uh, images. Uh, this takes uh, a few seconds. Uh, and if you actually go to the um, if you go here, you can actually start to see we're getting a selection of images uh, showing up as our data set. Um, just making sure we get the uh, labels uh, that we've gathered. Um, and we can see this is what the actual rasterized image uh, looks like. And the colors here actually represent uh, the over time the uh, movement of the image. So blue is where you started and green is in the middle and then it goes towards orange and red at the end of the stroke. Uh, we set up some uh, uh, Keras um, data sets. Uh, we're again just going to plot um, some of our uh, images just so we can make sure that they're coming through fine. We have this Keras model that I talked about before, which we're just setting up. Um, and here we're actually going to plot the layers. So if you want a visual indication of what the neural network is like, uh, Keras has a nice uh, utility for that here. And then we're actually going to train this model. So it's um, about uh, 30 epochs. It normally takes, um, uh, let's see, nine seconds times 30. Uh, yeah, it takes about four and a half minutes. So um, that may be pushing things <laughs> for how long we have uh, left. Uh, but let's see how that uh, gets on. Um, some of the other things that I'm probably going to skip over here, uh, where you can actually test the model once you've trained it. Um, and um, we're going to generate a uh, model once things have actually been um, uh, trained correctly. So we're going from Keras into TensorFlow Lite. Um, and as we go through um, that process, uh, this is where we're doing the quantization. Um, and one of the tricky things we have to do as part of that quantization is actually uh, feed in some representative input images so we can figure out the activation ranges. Um, so if you're wondering about this representative data set code, um, that's uh, what that's doing there. Um, and we're also going to be uh, skipping the testing, but you can always um, run this overall testing uh, on both your Keras and your TensorFlow Lite model to make sure that they actually match up. Um, and then we're actually going to 
um, take the results and put them into the Arduino IDE so that we can actually use this, um, uh, this model. Uh, and you can see it's, uh, it's about halfway uh, finished with the training here. Uh, and I'll just show you where the model lives in the Arduino IDE, because it might seem a little bit surprising. Um, what we actually do with the model is we take the .tflight file uh, that you'd normally save out on disk. And because um, a lot of embedded systems do not have anything like a file system, uh, instead of having it in a file system, we turn it into an array of bytes that we're going to include um, and compile as part of our program. Uh, so in the magic wand sketch, we take this G magic wand model data and uh, create a model out of it. Um, instead of loading it from disk, we're just taking this um, array of bytes. Um, so if we check here, uh, we're uh, cutting a bit close, but hopefully this will finish in the next uh, uh, minute or so. Uh, and then I'll be able to show you how you actually go from this uh, model uh, into this um, data uh, that we're showing here, because that's the fundamental way that you get from a model in TensorFlow uh, in the training environment over to something that you can actually run on an embedded device. Um, hi, Pete. Well, we're waiting for um, the uploading uh, part. Um, so um, there is a question um, about um, like someone new to TinyML. I think it's also interesting. So can we recognize some language using models deployed on Arduino? And uh, what kind of models it would be? So it was interesting about more applications. Yeah, so there's, um, if you're looking at doing audio recognition, uh, you know, this had the, the Arduino Sense actually has a microphone on it. Um, and there's an example showing how you can do simple uh, speech recognition. Um, oh, and here the, uh, um, so that is a great, uh, a great thing to look at. Um, and you can see, um, Sorry, jumping from that question, you can see that it's actually finished now with a validation accuracy of uh, 98%. Um, so I'm going to save this model out. And then uh, I'm going to uh, see if we can uh, take, uh, take the model and, uh, sorry, just a second. See if I can uh, convert it over to the uh, quantized uh, version. Uh, so here I'm going to uh, run the conversion. See here it prints out the, this is the number of bytes that the uh, model uh, uh, takes. So that's about just roughly 31K. Uh, I'm going to skip the testing and then just see if I can actually print out the um, results of turning this TF light model into a data array. And you can see it's a big array of bytes here. Uh, 31K is quite a lot in the IDE. Um, and I'm going to take that whole, um, uh, whole section and just put it into the Arduino IDE. I'm going to replace all of this with the model I've just trained. Uh, including the, uh, the length. Let's delete this. And then hopefully if I upload it, I should have a model that uh, actually uh, is uh, completely uh, new and trained from scratch using my digit data. So 
So fingers crossed, everybody. Okay, uh, and it has uh, finished. So let me try doing a seven and see if I can actually persuade it to still thinks that's a two. I got a one, come on, one seven. <laughs> the demo gods have struck, but yay, we got a seven. <laughs> so that's a model trained from scratch. Uh, I know we're out of time now, um, but um, there's a whole bunch of extra information in the slides if you're interested. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm uh, Pete Warden at google.com or I'm Pete Warden on Twitter. Um, feel free to uh, reach out. I'd love to hear you get on. I'd love to see this running on the ESP32 and other boards. Um, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Pete. Um, I think while well, we still have a little bit of time, so I will also read out like um, one question about a comment for the uh, degree of quantization and the accuracy uh, we would obtain from the models. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. We are using eight bit um, quantization, uh, and one of the things you can actually do in the CoLab is uh, compare the um, TensorFlow Lite um, quantized and unquantized models to see what the accuracy is like. So I'm going to run um, this TF Lite test function. Um, so this is the full float model first. It will tell us the accuracy. Uh, and you see it got 99.8% um, of the uh, test models correct, or the test images correct, and then this one is the quantized model. So let's see uh, how well it does. And in this case, um, it got almost the same uh, number, it got almost exactly the same um, accuracy. So um, this uh, tells us that Quantizing down to 8-bit hasn't really lost us um, much noticeable accuracy. So that's uh, that's one empirical um, data point. Okay. Um, so another question um, coming from the attendees that how do you achieve that sweet spot to balance out the minimizing the network, but at the same time still maintaining the accuracy? <laughs> yeah, well... The thing I actually find is the biggest thing that helps accuracy is actually improving the data set. So um, in this case, um, I've this is actually this is almost literally the model I have here uh, is almost literally the first model I tried. Um, and it's uh, in training, you can see that it's giving very high accuracy. So on the training data set that I've gathered, it um, it does extremely well. As you can see in practice, uh, it's still far from perfect when I'm actually using it. And that's usually a sign that there's um, a need for more data to be gathered. You know, uh, I've got 100 gestures that I've done myself um, are of each um, digit. Um, the model could probably do with more gestures by more people um, to help make it more robust. So I know that's not directly answering the question, but I, I really find I, I spend very little time on tweaking the model. I usually, usually I just try and use as a standard and off-the-shelf model architecture as I can. And I spend a lot more time tweaking the, you know, trying to gather more data and improve the data. Um, since we still have time until uh, 945, I think maybe we can go over more of the testing part. Um, oh, great. Okay. For, for the audience, yeah. 
Yeah, so I had us down for 45 minutes, which is why I was slightly rushing through this. <laughs> no, this is awesome. So um, in that case, um, we can look at, um, we have uh, the, um, uh, this test process here, uh, where we're actually um, figuring out which, um, I'm going to run this on the Keras model. Um, and this is actually telling me directly on the Keras model um, what the uh, uh, errors, and I'm actually printing out an image of the um, the gestures that gave particular errors. And this is important because it's really useful to be able to tell which um, images, uh, you know, which gestures and which data points your model is actually uh, really uh, struggling with. Because uh, that gives you a good idea of what you might actually want to um, try to uh, focus your data gathering on in particular. Um, so, uh, it's kind of small on my screen. It's probably even smaller on yours, but you can see in this case, the one that it's the ones that it's having trouble with are around the um, like fives that it thinks are, are actually threes. And if you look at that little thumbnail, you can see that that's um, uh, not particularly surprising. Um, and one thing you can do is actually go through and uh, create your own um, test images. Um, the good news is, since we have a little bit more time, I'm actually going to take you through, uh, you know, what I showed you just then was using a pre-trained um, model, which I gathered a bunch of digit data. I'm actually going to see if I can show you um, the uh, gathering your custom gestures so that you can actually do uh, Zs and Os and other uh, shapes that aren't in the uh, digit uh, data set. Um, so, if you recall, I actually ran this cell, which is downloading a uh, .json file uh, from uh, the web that I'd already put together. Um, but what I'm going to do now is, instead of that, let me see if I can uh, reload this page and uh, connect using uh, Bluetooth. Um, and let me see if I can gather uh, maybe uh, 10 uh, Zs, uh, and then I'll pick uh, another, uh, another gesture to go along with that. So let me... So that's one. I kind of like that. I'll keep that. It's another. You do a big one. Here we go. It's another. And you can see up in the top corner, there's actually a counter showing how many of these gestures have actually been captured. So like I said, I'm going to see if I can capture. You know, that one's a bit wobbly, but that's not bad. You want some some that aren't perfect, uh, so the network can actually learn. Um, I'm going to see if I can capture uh, at least 20 uh, of these uh, Zorro strokes. Uh, and you'll notice I'm always starting at the top and going down. Um, order does matter when doing these gestures. Uh, so you do have to be a little bit uh, thoughtful. Uh, you know, if I started at the bottom and went up, uh, the model would be unlikely to recognize that as a Z. So if you want to recognize Zs going both ways, you could gather some more that were actually started from the bottom as well. Um, so I'm getting close to having enough Zs. I'm going to have to, oh, and there you can see um, it actually decides what gestures to capture um, by waiting for the wand to be still, and then when there's a bit of motion, it captures that and then stops when it goes still again. 
So it's almost like um, uh, spaces between words, but sometimes it can get it wrong like it did in that case. So I'm just going to delete that one and then uh, let's try capturing some more. And we only need a few more, I think. And then we're going to have to decide what the second gesture is going to be. And again, that's a little mistake, so I'll delete that. Um, and I think that I'm going to do just uh, straight down like a, uh, um, well actually that's a bit slim to one, so let's do a, a slash cross from left to right. There's one, two, oh, that was the wrong way, three, five, Six. Well, that was a mistake. And you may not be able to see, but I'm slowly, because I'm slowly moving the wand back, it's not capturing it as a gesture, which is what I want. Um, so if you're careful between gestures, you can avoid capturing uh, any mistakes. That one I went back too fast. Not this mistake. Getting close. Just a few more. And there, we should have 20 of each. Um, so I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to go through and label these. I'm going to give S for slash for all of these. You can use uh, full names if you want, but I'm just going to use uh, single letters. I'm just clicking on the question mark and updating the label. And again, you, if you've done this, you have to be very careful not to uh, leave the page um, or you'll lose all your data, which can be annoying if you've uh, spent a bunch of time putting in uh, gestures. Uh, if I was a better web programmer, I could probably also do a slightly more ergonomic way of uh, labeling everything, but uh, I'm not, so this is what you get. Um, and hopefully I'm coming up to about 20 slashes. Ooh, I can actually hit tab. I never knew that. There we go. Makes life easier. And yeah, so we've got all of the uh, slashes. Uh, now we're on to the Zs. So I'm going to give Z. Uh, for all of these as the label, and I'm just hitting tab, which I didn't even know I could do until I tried it. Um, and I'm going to label all of these with Z. And one thing to note is the model only picks from the choices it knows about. So it doesn't have the idea of I don't know what that gesture is. It will always, if it's given a gesture, it will always try and put the gesture into one of the um, categories that it's been given, one of the classes it's been given. Um, so this model is always going to choose either slash or Z uh, for its, even if you give it um, gestures that it hasn't been trained on. Uh, and that's quite a common uh, problem with uh, 
these sorts of um, convolutional networks, uh, they often will actually uh, not be able to deal with out of domain uh, content. So here I'm going to, uh, let me take this and put it on the desktop just so I can grab it. So this one data is the one that I just, uh, I hit the download data on the uh, web page where I did the labeling um, and it contains um, a bunch of JSON data. Uh, let me see if I can actually load it up into uh, Visual Studio Code since it has a nice uh, JSON view. So what you can see here uh, is um, the list of uh, points in uh, a stroke. Um, and together with that list of coordinates, uh, there's actually uh, some, uh, uh, you get a label. Um, so there's, uh, that's the training data that we're feeding in. So here I'm going to say, okay, open this. Uh, it's uh, grabbed it. Um, and if we uh, take a uh, let me see. So we'll need to update the number of gestures here. We've only got two gestures now. So you need to update that and you need to run this cell so that it's actually updated. Um, and one thing I want to be careful of is we already have all of this, um, all of these uh, files with uh, our data in because I've already just, uh, I've just run this once. So one of the things I'm going to do is actually just do Uh, see if I get this right. So I've just, um, I've just removed the data set. Um, just uh, because we ha still have the old content from the uh, digits. So, let me just run the setup. Then I'm going to upload one data. And now if I refresh, the file view, you should see in the data set, all we have is this uh, ones data. We don't have any more of the Pete Wharton uh, digit um, data sets that I uh, grabbed earlier. So I'm going to get rid of that line so we still don't need it anymore. We've set the number of gestures to two. Going to uh, grab uh, this um, data, and now we actually have this list of uh, strokes. Uh, so let's uh, do what we did before and see if we can visualize uh, one of these strokes. See, this is from the digits data set before. Now we're going to try and plot the first stroke, which I'm hoping might be a Z. Yeah, so here you can actually see we're plotting uh, some of the strokes. Uh, you know, one of the real strokes that we just captured as you were watching. So now I'm going to go through and uh, see if we can actually um, turn this data set into images. So if you remember with the um, view in Visual Studio Code, we have this list of coordinates. Um, but it can be tricky to train a, especially a convolutional neural network on a uh, list like this. So what we want to do instead is turn it into something that's a lot more familiar. 
Um, so if we refresh, uh, you can actually see that we have two uh, folders, one for each gesture type, uh, and each one of them actually has, you might be able to see there, I just opened up the PNG, uh, it has a, uh, has turned the stroke into one of these images. And if I go to Z, uh, and let me know if there are any questions, you two. Sure, um, there is one question about um, how to convert this accelerated trace like generated by the wand to actually this uh, 2D PNG image. Well, yeah. exactly on this topic. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's it's quite a, um, so what I actually end up doing is, let me see if I can find this here. I've written my own Python code to take the list of points and um, it takes, um, uh, it creates a byte array uh, that represents the pixels. Um, and if you see here, it goes through each point, um, it turns um, each point uh, into a coordinate, uh, figures out what the color should be. Um, and then it, this is my very sort of homebrewed implementation of um, like a line drawing algorithm. So it goes through each pixel in the line, steps through and uh, writes that into the byte array. Um, and then it returns a NumPy buffer uh, containing that. And then once we've done that, we just turn the NumPy buffer into an image uh, using uh, the Python image library and save it out. Um, and the other thing that you actually have to be careful of is because we're doing this during training, we have to do something equivalent on the Arduino side. Uh, so if we go to the Arduino um, code, you'll see I've actually got a C++ version of this same code uh, that takes the stroke points and actually turns them into um, a rasterized uh, equivalent of an image buffer. Um, so if you go through this line by line and compare the C++ code, uh, you should find that it, it matches uh, the, um, uh, the code that I have up here. And that's something that's pretty important when you're doing pre-processing like this, going from accelerometer data through to something that's actually um, you're going to be feeding into a neural network, it's pretty important that you're able to get both the training and the deployment code matching as closely as possible. Um, and actually on that topic, another thing that's challenging uh, is actually um, you don't get um, coordinates out of this when you're doing the IMU, you just get changes in velocity. Um, so there's actually a bunch of code. Uh, let me see if I can find uh, uh, the uh, yeah. There's a bunch of code that actually turns the um, uh, accelerometer into uh, uh, points and turns it into uh, something that can be uh, read as stroke points. So uh, that can be pretty challenging too. But let's see if we can go to now we've created these um, uh, these data sets. Uh, I'm going to just break it up into uh, training test and validation. Um, let's have a look at what the labels are. Hopefully, yes, we've got zero is S, one is Z. Uh, let's just do another visualize. I like to keep visualizing as we're training just to make sure that things are doing uh, what I'd expect. Uh, you can see there is a Z, which uh, looks uh, pretty promising. I'll create the uh, validation and training data sets. Um, 
one thing we've also been doing actually here is augmenting uh, because we know we only have a small amount of uh, data. So we're taking the original um, things that we captured and we're adding like small variations to the uh, position and rotation um, so that uh, we'll hopefully be able to recognize um, uh, more robustly um, by increasing, artificially increasing the size of our training data set. Um, so just to make sure that things are still working, let's do another view of that. You can see we've got some Z's and we've got some slashes. Uh, we've uh, got this model defined. Uh, I think we already plotted it, but let's plot it again just to make sure. Uh, and now let's see if we can actually uh, train this. And again, this will take about five minutes. Um, so, oh, actually, in this case, it's a lot quicker. I forgot because we have a much smaller amount of data. So each epoch is, um, you know, only going to take uh, a few seconds. Yeah, it just takes um, just over one second per step. Um, and it claims it made it to um, a very high accuracy. Uh, that probably means that uh, we're overfitting to the uh, data uh, and we might need to gather more data in our set. But let's, um, let's try testing that model and see what happens. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's claiming it found 25% uh, correct, which uh, probably means that we're uh, struggling a bit with the amount of, um, we need more classes or we need more data in there. But let's give it a, let's give it a try and see uh, how it does. Um, just going to save this out as we did before, create this .cc file. I'm going to select all of these, take this over to the Arduino, uh, select everything in here and replace it. I won't uh, save it out, but I have just replaced it. And I'm also going to uh, change um, the number of labels. So in this case, I'm going to update the label count and I'm going to have S and Z be the labels that we're looking for. Save that out. But let's A few seconds to flash. Uh, we found a slash. Try that again. Found a slash. Let's see if it's got any chance of finding a Z. That may be a bit of a challenge, but no, it's a. Uh, what's likely has happened here is uh, it's got stuck in a uh, training point where it thinks everything is an S <laughs> and it did well enough um, that uh, it just got uh, <clears throat> stuck in there. So what I uh, normally do in this case is actually start to gather some uh, more data, um, possibly, you know, try instead of the uh, Z, try a Z and an O 
rather than a z and a slash, uh, since that first part of the slash is very similar to the first part of the z, uh, which may be causing it some problems in distinguishing between the, uh, um, the two gestures. But at least now you get to see that I'm doing this live, um, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not controlling the outcomes. Uh, and you get to see a little bit of what the life, uh, the day in the life of an ML uh, engineer is like. This is great, Cliff. Um, and then there, there's one more question about the inference time, because I think you were just show like about the live inference uh, for the two characters you train. Can you comment more on the inference time? Yeah, the nice thing about the um, uh, the Arduino Nano is it's um, it's it's a fast enough chip that for a model this small, uh, it's I really have not actually um, uh, had to measure um, the time. Um, like it's been fast enough that it it really hasn't been noticeable especially because in this case I'm only running it once per gesture. So the gesture itself takes, you know, a, a second or half a second to do. Um, and the inference is much, much faster. It's just, it seems like it's, I'm guessing it's on the order of tens of milliseconds to run. Um, so, um, yeah, this is actually quite a nice application because we haven't needed to do much heavy lifting. If you're doing something like image processing, like the person detection example that we have in there, uh, then it does get uh, a bit more, uh, you have to think a lot more about um, the, uh, how to optimize your model. Um, and you might only get one frame per second um, on that, you know, a model that's that large. Um, so while we're talking about the model differences, there is a folding question about the fundamental differences between CMSS and N, RUI and X and NPAC, Q and NPAC, and then this gym loop uh, for the 8-bit quantization models inference on these uh, ARM-based microcontrollers. So basically the comment is that the bottleneck is often the matrix multiplication, and uh, all these uh, libraries seems to try to optimize kernels for that. So the question is more onto the differences between different models, if you can comment on this. Yeah, so um, the XNN pack and the RUI and the Gemlo P libraries are all optimized for the ARM Cortex-A um, devices, which you'll find on uh, mobile phones and the Raspberry Pi and other um, comparatively high um, high power, you know, comparatively high cost um, uh, mainline CPUs. <clears throat> we actually use um, the Simsys NN library from ARM to optimize our code because we're running on ARM Cortex M uh, chips, <clears throat> which are much smaller and cheaper. Um, and only have, you know, typically a few hundred kilobytes of RAM. Um, and uh, we also have similar optimizations for uh, things uh, like uh, Cadence and uh, Qualcomm and um, a bunch of the other popular microcontroller and DSPs. Um, on the mobile side, um, it's been really great. I haven't been closely involved, but it's really been really great to see all the work that's been happening on uh, RUI um, because there's a whole bunch of things for matrix multiply, especially when you have a cache, which a lot of these uh, microcontrollers that are working on really don't have anything that you consider um, cache memory. Um, you know, there is often a little bit, but it's often manu very manually controlled. On the ARM Cortex A series, these RUI libraries and Gemlo P and XNM pack, um, they're all very carefully designed to try and keep data in tiles uh, in memory when you're doing these matrix multiplies. Um, and it kind of blows my mind how many different strategies there are to do um, this, what's fundamentally a very simple um, algorithm which is, you know, like three kind of 
uh, for loops nested inside each other to do matrix multiplication. You know, they'll fit on half a screen if you look at the reference implementation. But because there's so much complexity about keeping um, as many values as possible in the cache, um, all of these um, libraries have taken different approaches. Uh, from what I remember, XNM pack is very much focused, was has been very much focused on um, the float case, while uh, GemLoP was uh, set up to do the 8-bit uh, matrix multiply. Um, I understand that there's a lot more crossover work that's been happening over the last, um, especially over the last year. Um, so, so I'm not completely up to date on that, but um, uh, the teams behind it are great. Um, and I expect to see a lot of cool stuff coming out of that. Thanks, Pete. Um, so there's another question about, um, want to um, um, see your comment on the RNN based net networks um, on the microcontrollers, such as the LSTM and GRUs, and I want to know your uh, opinion on do they going to be suffer a lot from the quantization point of view? So um, the good news is that we've actually got, um, we've seen good results with quantized LSTMs, for example, on TensorFlow Lite uh, for mobile. Um, so the accuracy side, uh, we're not too worried about. We um, don't yet have a date for including LSTM support in TensorFlow Lite Micro uh, because we want to do a good job, especially with the examples um, and having um, some, uh, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, documentation, um, especially around saving out models and quantizing. Um, so. The good news is the accuracy hasn't been uh, a blocker, but we have a lot more work to do um, around the implementation uh, on TensorFlow Lite Micro. So that is um, why they aren't available yet. Thanks, Pete. Um, so I think there are more questions about um, uh, like the algorithm support, for example, one, one question is that for tiny ML, most of the predominantly uh, uh, models are based on NNs. Um, so how does it also support the classical ML algorithms like log logistic reg and tree-based algorithms and something like that? Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting question um, because especially for um, structured data, um, a lot of those algorithms are great um, and uh, very useful. Um, what we're focused on is primarily uh, microphone and accelerometer and image uh, data inputs, which are very sort of noisy and messy and are kind of like this super very unstructured data uh, where um, these convolutional, like CNN and RNN algorithms tend to be a lot better than the more traditional machine learning algorithms. So we've, uh, you know, made a decision to focus on those use cases. Um, there's a whole bunch of really, uh, great, um, libraries out there, uh, for things like random forest, um, and other approaches that you can run on embedded devices. I think, you know, I think of things like Sensi ML. Um, they uh, do a great job there. Uh, I know there's been a lot of work from uh, Microsoft. I think they, they have, I think it's the embedded machine learning library, which has a lot of support for, um, you know, things like uh, random forest uh, and things like that. So the good news is there is, um, quite a lot of support um, out there for some of those algorithms. We're, um, you know, with TensorFlow like Micro, we're pretty heavily focused on the convolutional and the recurrent, um, you know, the deep learning uh, style of uh, networks. Okay. So more on the TensorFlow Lite support. Um, so like one question is, uh, how does the TensorFlow Lite support the int-8 quantization for hybrid architectures, for example, like 
CNNs plus GRUs plus fully clinical leaders? <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's that's a tricky yeah that's a tricky question um, because we don't have any official support yet for uh, RNNs. Uh, we aren't um, we haven't had to work too much on the combinations of those we have seen at least on the tensorflow light for mobile side like running on the arm cortex a um that people have been pretty successful with you know for example plugging in quantized um convolutional networks into rnns as inputs to rnns um and having that all work even though quantization is happening um like 8-bit quantization seems like it's actually we I can't think of many models where 8-bit quantization hasn't been good enough for, you know, production use cases. Okay. Um, so also, like, one question is, that, is there any way to know about the memory footprint of a uh, TF Lite model in a given hardware year? Yeah, so that's um, something we're actually doing a lot of work on at the moment, because uh, we know uh, from working with um, product teams, you know, especially inside Google, that often the thing that's stopping you from deploying is that you don't fit within the memory footprint of some of these devices. Um, so one of the things that takes up memory is, you know, just uh, coming back to this, you know, this is 30 kilobytes um, just for the model, uh, you know, which isn't, uh, you know, a trivial amount of space. Um, so at least when you're training, you get to see, okay, this is actually the size of this thing. Um, another thing we've actually done is um, in this collab notebook, you can actually look at what the size of the different uh, models is. Um, so here, the, um, you know, the Keras model, uh, is like, you know, 66, uh, or 6,600, yeah, like 660K, something like that. Uh, the, the float TensorFlow Lite model is a hundred kilobytes and then quantized, we get down to the 30 kilobyte size. Um. Uh, now that's one that's using up memory in flash because it's read only, but another thing you have to think about is, um, the calculations require some working memory. Um, and figuring this out is involves a bit of experimentation. Um, so, uh, in this case, we found that you need about 30 kilobytes of memory for the activation buffers and for things like that. Um, so that's another thing you have to sort of calculate in and then, uh, yeah, another thing you have, to, and this is coming from SRAM, um, because it needs to be uh, read, write. And then yet another thing you have to think about is how the, um, machine learning code itself adds to the size of your binary. Um, so we have a base size we hope of around 20 kilobytes just for the core library um, and then one of the things we actually do is we have this op resolver approach where you can choose just to pull in the layers the implementations of the layers that you need for your particular model because there's something like you know 70 different ops at the moment in tensorflow like micro if we included all of the code for those all of the time, even when you didn't need it, it would be pretty wasteful. Um, so instead, we have this mechanism for pulling in just the ops you need. So that's a very long answer, <laughs> but it's um, those are the three main components. You have to think about the model size, um, the arena size for kind of scratch working memory uh, that lives in RAM, and then the uh, code size that you're adding on to your application by including the machine learning library. Thanks, Pete. Maybe the last question, because we have one minute to the end. Um, so some like the audience want to know, is there a, a step by step guideline if you want to uh, deploy a TensorFlow like model on another platform, for example, the, an, an, an SP based platform or, uh, or like some like some other kit? Yes, so 
Uh, what I'd recommend is um, a bunch of these platforms actually already have uh, ports, uh, but if you don't find your platform um, already uh, listed, we have some docs here about um, porting to a new platform and actually how you can get um, TensorFlow Lite Micro up and running. So I'm hoping that if you go to uh, GitHub and then you look in TensorFlow Lite Micro docs, new platform support, uh, that that might help. Thank you very much, Pete. Let's thank uh, our speaker, and I think this is the end of the first tutorial. Thank you awesome. very much. Thanks, Yichi. Would like to acknowledge our sponsors first. It's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Qualcomm. Samsung. These three are the executive, sp executive sponsors. And, and then followed by Platinum sponsors. PTA Compute. Lattice semiconductors and the gold sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse. Emza Visual Sense, Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies, Hymex, ImagiMob, Legend AI. Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant and Google TensorFlow. Exmos, and the civil sponsors are H Cortex, Hoots, and uh, Syncense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world.